Welcome back to the Talking Archive. I'm Josh Jacobs. By the way, subscribe to our YouTube channel right now at the Talking Archive. Just click on subscribe. Tell your friends about it. We'd love to have you uh, be part of our subscription. It's free, by the way. You don't have to pay a th- one thin dime. Also, you can uh, follow us on Instagram at joshdj57. Our guest is John F. Schneider. He's the proprietor of theradiohistorian.org. Now, John, tell us about how you started the website. Well, since college, I've been uh, building a collection of uh, uh, historical radio photographs, just my own personal collection. And it is now up to about 3,500 original photographs from that era. I uh, started putting them on the web in actually in about 1995. Mm. When the Internet was just first raising its ugly head in the world, I was uh, I decided to use it to put up a site and put some photographs up. Wow. And so I have been building it continually since that time. Um uh, uh, I have uh, I have written. Uh, you mentioned two books, but I also write lots of uh, uh, magazine articles for uh, several different uh, publications. And um, over the years, the articles that I've written, I have put on the website as well. So the content has just built over the course of uh, what's now, I guess, almost thirty years of being on the internet. Hmm. Yeah, and there's quite a few uh, great pictures there. I've, uh, it's, I'm like a kid in a candy store looking at all of them. And um, one of the pictures that really stood out to me was the NBC San Francisco building. It's still there, uh, which was music, music to my ears because they had a beautiful building in, in Hollywood um, on Sunset and Vine, which unfortunately got bulldozed after only being around for about 26 years. And... Um, but I noticed the pictures of the lobby of the NBC San Francisco building looked a lot like the pictures in the lobby of the uh, uh, NBC Hollywood building. It's, it's, it was like a carbon copy inside almost, which I thought was really cool. Um, how much has the interior of that building uh, been changed since it was an NBC studio? Uh, what's still there? What has been taken away? Well, I have... I. I live in uh, the Midwest, so I'm a long way from San Francisco. I have not been in the inside of that building, but I understand that it was completely gutted and uh, turned into uh, office space. Um, oh. So the, the original studios and everything are are gone. Uh, several of the studios were two stories in height, so um, those were uh, removed and floors the floors were extended over that space. And it's now a uh, uh, commercial office building called the 420 Taylor Building. The good news is that there was a a beautiful uh, mosaic tile mural over the main entrance of that building depicting uh, broadcasting in a uh, a very artistic way. And uh, that mural was restored and is still gracing the front of that building. That's terrific. Yeah, the the uh, you know a lot of the early uh, radio uh, studio buildings, like the NBC building you mentioned, are gone. Unfortunately, um, buildings that were for large studio operations, it wasn't very practical to take to move into an existing building because they weren't built in a way that broadcasters needed. They needed uh, rooms with higher ceilings. They needed uh, more sound insulation than most commercial buildings provided. They needed uh, uh, air conditioning that was very quiet. Um, So uh, pretty much all of those um, big studio buildings were built from scratch as specialty buildings. And then when they were no longer needed for live radio broadcasting after the uh, era of live radio was done, they really weren't very suitable to be converted for other purposes. So a lot of them were lost. But uh, fortunately, the San Francisco building remains. And uh, just this month, I have a uh, cover story coming out in Radio World magazine about the uh, WWJ uh, studio building in Detroit, which um, was converted into the Cambria Hotel. 
mm. and uh, is is now a hotel building. There's very little that remains in the interior that is original to the broadcasting operation. Um, but they did keep some some artifacts, and they have photographs and and uh, and. Uh, art all over the building and throughout the hotel that is uh, um, that is a depiction or a recollection of what the uh, original uh, studio building was. So that's another fortunate case mm-hmm. of a uh, of a broadcasting building that has been converted to new use. It's obsolete as a broadcasting building, but they're they, they've they've converted it for another purpose. And are uh, uh, in the process are saluting the history that the building has as a broadcast center, Columbia Plaza in uh, Hollywood, uh, mm-hmm. the, the original Western broadcast headquarters for CBS is another case like that. Oh yeah. So there are three buildings I'm aware of, and I guess the fourth one would be the uh, tall building in Philadelphia that was a broadcast uh, radio station facility and is now a uh, uh, historical museum. All right. You know, it's interesting. I got my internship. My first internship was at uh, Columbia Square for Oldies 93 CBS FM, which uh, okay, right. was around for about four years. Originally, it was Canix FM, the uh, Mellow Rock station, also known as the Mellow Sound. And, um, you know, going through there, it was, it was a really cool stairway that looked like almost a cruise ship as you looked through those round windows. And yeah. um, when I heard a couple of years ago they wanted to tear it down, but then they were able to make it a historic landmark, and they really did restore it to its showroom shine. They even have on the side of the building neon signage where the cool CBS neon sign was for many years. Unfortunately, that beautiful CBS neon sign got replaced by these simple and plain block letters come the 1960s, I guess because of maintenance and upkeep. But they also, uh, for years, the uh, kind of like the the – um, drive-in area where stars used to get off in their cars got blocked with with fencing for many years, and that's been taken down. So you can actually go up there again, and they even have, uh, have a restaurant I think called the Paley Restaurant in honor Wonderful. of uh, uh, Bill Paley, the founder and longtime owner of CBS. So it's very very beautiful, and uh, I'm really impressed by it. They were they, they they did build a high-rise building behind it, but it's got the character and the charm of the original. Uh, Columbia Square. I'm sure the interior looks completely different, but even then, when I interned, by that point, uh, the studios had probably been changed completely from what they had been before, and then also uh, KNXT, eventually KCBS Channel 2 was there for probably about 40 years until they moved to uh, the CBS Studio Center in uh, Studio City, um, the, also CBS Radford. Right. Uh, probably the only exception to the track that we've talk, just talked about is Rockefeller Center in New York City, which continues to be a major broadcast production center. Um, it was built in uh, uh, 1932 for uh, for NBC Radio and had uh, more than two dozen radio studios. Um, it's been completely converted for television. And so a lot of, uh, uh, very little of what's there is original to the beginnings of the building, but it is still, it still has the large studios, except that uh, they are being used for television instead of radio purposes. Yeah, in fact, uh, the original uh, NBC studios, well, 66 WNBC was there for many, many years. And uh, a couple months ago, I got to interview Frank Reed, who, was middays on the station when Imus was mornings and Howard Stern was afternoon. And so he had some great stories about that uh, that historical uh, studio there, um, which, of course, is like you said, is gone and gone the way of mainly television. And then also um, some of those studios were, I mean, like the, the game show 21 was made there as well. And so that studio is completely different. I think the uh, late show with, uh, not late show, but uh, late night with Seth Myers is made there. Before that was Conan O'Brien and then David Letterman before that. Um, but ABC got rid of their classic studios in New York. 
Uh, the only thing that really really have as far as just other things is the CBS Studio 50, where which also known as the Ed Sullivan Theater. That's probably the only really historical thing that CBS has there besides Rockefeller Plaza for NBC. Um, ABC got rid of their Elysee Theater where uh, the twenty thousand dollar pyramid was originally made a couple of years ago, and that was kind of I was kind of bummed to hear about that. I thought, wow, they got rid of that historical theater because New York seems to be better in preserving old buildings than the West Coast is. Right, right. Well, I mean, they don't have room to build out elsewhere, so they have to they have to keep reusing the space they've got. Exactly. Um, and of course, the Today Show began their windows on the world when uh, Dave Garraway debuted the show in 52. And then by the time he was gone, they moved upstairs. But then about 32 years after Garraway's last broadcast, they again started broadcasting on the first level with the windows on the world. And pretty much every morning news show now does their own windows on the world type of feature where you got the uh, visitors lined up watching the, the, the show being broadcast in real time, which I think is pretty cool. Well, um, one of the uh, one of the interesting places in Rockefeller Center is Studio 8H, mm-hmm. uh, which is the uh, origination point for Saturday Night Live. That, when it was built, was the world's largest uh, broadcasting studio. Um, it seated about 1,500 people and was the place where the... Uh, NBC Symphony Orchestra, led by Arturo Toscanini, broadcasts were, were done live. Wow. And uh, that studio still exists, so it's been chopped up and, and modified so much for TV, you wouldn't recognize it from its early days, but that same physical space is still in use today. It's interesting looking at the studio, because not right now, but the early days of Saturday night, um, they oftentimes panned around the audience, and you could see this cool-looking balcony formation. It was completely looking – it was different from any other TV studio I've ever seen. And that's why, because of that whole orchestra thing. That's that's great to hear about that. I've never – I didn't know that story before. Um, by the way, I, I had a question for you about the um, local Bay Area and Seattle stations that uh, – during the early days of radio um, – A lot of national radio shows, unfortunately, have been lost from back in that era, but there are some that still exist. Uh, There's even shows like Hollywood 360 with Carl Amari, which broadcasts some of those, like the Jack Benny program and uh, Sam Spade. Um, What percentage of those national shows still exist, and what percentage of the local like Bay Area-only shows are in existence as far as any tape is concerned to them? Well, there was virtually no... Uh, recording technology that was practical until the mid-30s. So anything before about 1934 or 1935 is lost forever. It was broadcast live, it went into the ether, and disappeared. Um, Starting in 1935 or so, some of the network programs started to be recorded on 16-inch acetate discs. And a number of those have survived. As you get into the uh, 40s, the greater percentage of network programs were recorded. And I would say maybe 60, 70, 60 to 75% of the important network national programs from the 1940s still exist on recordings. They existed for a long time as acetate discs in people's private collections Mm -hmm. and were traded in uh, poor copies of of audio tapes, copies of copies of copies of copies. Now, with the Internet and MP3 files, they're mostly all available to anyone who, who cares to listen. If you want to listen to the Sam Spade program, you can go find a site on the web and in... 15 minutes download all of the known recordings of that show and have the entire series at your fingertips. So that, as I say, from uh, the 40s and beyond uh, national programs, there's a wide assortment available. Now, on the local level, that's something entirely different because uh, um, recordings were not cheap, and they had to have a... uh, 
a reason to record it. Maybe the sponsor wanted to hear the program and wanted a copy of it, or the network decided that they were going to rebroadcast it at a different time or send it to another station for broadcast. So selected programs were recorded. On my website, I have uh, a collection of San Francisco radio shows that were uh, uh, fortunately saved, and I managed to get audio copies of. Some of them are from NBC and others, uh, local programs. A real rare one that there are uh, several recordings of is the uh, Blue Monday Jamboree, which was broadcast on KFRC starting in 1929, and that was one of the first radio variety comedy shows Mm. and it was extremely popular all up and down the west coast broadcast over the donnelly uh columbia network to six stations or so and it originated out of the kfrc studios on uh, van ness avenue in san francisco and um there are i think three of those programs that survived on uh, acetate recordings, and I do have those on my website. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really interesting to listen to because it's some um, of uh, the very earliest radio entertainment programming. And uh, did you get to interview anybody from the uh, Blue Monday Jamboree? Um, I did talk to the engineer. And, and got some uh, some interesting stories from that and uh, from him and oh let me let me think here uh, a musician who worked on the uh, series and I corresponded with a uh, comedian who uh, uh, was part of a comedy team that was in that program so it it was pretty pretty old and half forgotten even by the time I started doing the research on it but it was. It was a huge hit at the time, and the uh, performers, uh, comedians, and entertainers uh, between the shows would go up and down the uh, Pacific Coast and would do live appearances in theaters in uh, uh, different cities wow. and would draw big crowds. And were those performances broadca- broadcast directly to the radio, or were they recorded for later broadcast? No, everything was live. Oh, okay. Um, you know, there's... A, there's one interesting story I remember is they were uh, doing an interview with uh, someone from uh, the Union Pacific Railroad and w- wanted to talk about uh, the processes of running a uh, uh, running a locomotive. And in, for effect, they decided to bring a uh, a real locomotive steam whistle into the studio. And so they set it all up with an air compressor, and during the uh, uh, the broadcast, decided uh, uh, at the appropriate time to uh, sound the steam whistle, which was so loud, it blew up the transmitter, and KFRC was off the air for two days. Oh, no. <laughs> you, you don't have that recording, do you? <laughs> no, there is no recording of that. <laughs> I've got to tell my chief engineer that, that story. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, yeah be- before the days of audio processors uh they actually in in a studio they would have a uh, uh an operator with his hands on the microphone mixers writing gain if the, if the sound was too too soft he would bring it up if it was louder he would turn it down and his job was to try and uh, anticipate and adjust the sound levels manually to keep the program uh, uh, volume level constant. And uh, uh, clearly that man did not anticipate how loud that uh, steam whistle would be. <laughs> I, I, know, I know that in, uh, in a, at least one broadcasting station I'm aware of for a musical program, they, in addition to the engineer writing the game, they would hire a uh, musician to come in with the sheet music in front of him of the music that was being performed by the orchestra. So he could read the music and he would know when it would go from soft to loud and would uh, would cue the engineer to bring it down or bring it up wow. at the appropriate moments. So uh, this is, uh, um, as I said, entirely manual audio processing. Wow, that's amazing. 
and 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 great to hear about that. You know, I've, I remember going to these old recreations of radio shows they presented. You know, over the years, um, right. KCRW eighty nine point nine, which is one of the NPR affiliates in Southern California, had a recreation of a radio show, and um, they had some famous actors uh, playing the roles in this radio drama recreation, but never heard anything like that where somebody actually had the sheet music in front of them. This is the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs. We're talking with John F. Schneider, who is the owner and writer at theradiohistorian.org. And next time, John discusses some funny moments where radio stars pulled practical jokes on one another.